I went a long way with the American Office actually. I didn't. I didn't see. I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen an awful lot of them, and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's different from our show, but at the same time, when there are similarities, I was able to kind of see what people liked about our show. The Office. When I think of The Office, it's hard not to think of the experience of The Office, because the experience was so genuinely funny. It was like a crash course for me in doing something that I have enjoyed since, which is occasionally just trying not to act at all. Do you know what I mean? Like trying to do away with any artifice or anything between you as a performer and the character and the audience. It's like, just be absolutely as real as possible. Don't do any acting. And that's it. I mean, ever since really, that's sort of been my favorite type of acting. Uh, I'm a sales rep, which means that my job is to speak to clients on the phone about uh, quantity and type of paper and whether we can supply it with them and whether they can pay for it. And I'm boring myself talking about it. it is... So Tim allowed me to, you know, I've got a brother called Tim even, and I sort of based little bits of my interpretation of Tim, a little bit on myself, obviously, and a little bit on family members. And so, yeah, it was, that was what I thought of the character. And he was pretty much the conduit for the audience, you know. And I think that was the first time that I'd played that sort of character. And I've, I've played them since. What's up? Hey, what's up? I love that. What's up? Oh. You're fired, Keenan. Drunkard. <laughs> Hypocrite warning. Oh, God. Oh, what's he been saying? It's all true. <laughs> Guilty as charged. I'm a sucker for good writing. And the, the writing on The Office by Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant was just... It was just really good. It was really, really good. What I loved about them was they sort of... They didn't know anything, but they knew everything. Do you know what I mean? They kind of... They were very unschooled and very untutored, but had a freshness to them that was um, alarming, actually. When I first heard about it, I, of course, I was quite resistant. I thought, why do they need to do this? I'll just show ours, you know. Um, and actually, once I saw the show, I really liked it. I went a long way with The American Office, actually. I, didn't, I, didn't see, I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen an awful lot of them. And thoroughly enjoyed it. I, it's different from our show, but at the same time, when there are similarities, I was able to kind of see what people liked about our show. The Jim and Pam thing, kind of echoing the Tim and Dawn story, I was able to sort of see, oh yeah, that's why people really love that story. It's just very two, two very sweet, normal people falling in love in a very sweet way. What's he doing? What's he doing? What's Warren doing telling people to say, please, <laughs> if they don't know, I'm sorry, you don't deserve a job, aren't you? It was shot very cleverly. And the whole conceit of it sort of being like a mock documentary was that any glance, like anything that you put over to somebody else is picked up. So you don't have to overact, you don't have to over-egg it, like the camera's seeing everything, or everything that the, you know, the, the team wants the camera to see. So it would only take you know, me or Lucy Davis, who played Dawn, just you know, to, do, to do that. And people, people know, people know what it is, and I, and I loved doing that. It's like a sort of, an exercise in honing subtlety, actually, from a, from a craft point of view. Okay, good, that's fine. Yeah, all right. Uh, it's a bit dark, actually, I didn't bring a flash. Uh, probably won't be able to use these, actually. Okay, don't be disappointed if they're not in. No. Yeah, it was the thing okay. that people Cheers. shouted at me for a good couple of years, you know, for my own personal life, it was the character that made people know who I am. Um, even before I knew who I was. And I'm still on that journey. I remember being in New York once in a luggage shop and people would come up and quote like David Brent's lines to me. So David Brent had some horrendous lines and so I'm just looking at luggage and this guy came in and went, I think there's been a rape up there. And I thought that A, not my line, B, C, I'm off. The Hobbit. I think whether you're James Cagney or me or who, whoever, you know, name any one of a hundred actors, whoever you are and whatever you're bringing, it has to be real. 
right? So if you put James Cagney in a film now, he would seem kind of big, right? He would, that was like, that's a strong flavor. I didn't disbelieve anything he ever said, right? Nothing, because he means it, right? So whether you're doing something that is up to 11 or something that's two or three, as long as you invest it with the truth of that moment, hopefully the audience will go along with that and believe it. I can't take this. The blade is of elvish, mate. I have never used a sword in my life. And I hope you never have to. The thing about something like The Hobbit is, because it's a, it's a big old beast, right? And it's fantastical. I mean, literally, it's a, you know, it's a huge fantasy story. But unless you imbue it with real humanity, then why should people care? I always felt that Ian McKellen did it really, really well. You know, like he, he walked that line between the big and the, the sort of epic and the very, very human and the vulnerable brilliantly. No idea you were still in business. And where else should I be? <laughs> I think, well, no, you're not acting as a person would act or even as a hobbit would act or as an elf would act. You know, I think still, if it's about you trying, if it's about you trying to look heroic or if it's about you trying to look cool or sexy or whatever, I'm just not, I'm just not interested. I'm not interested. You know, because if, if, then you've forgotten the, the point of the scene, you know, if you're trying to get your cheekbones into it, you know. So, fortunately for me, I don't have any cheekbones, so that's not a, it's not really a worry for me ever. There are parts of him facially and physically that I felt, I was thinking of like a sort of woodland creature. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, not even a specific one. I'm not even that detailed an actor. Just like, a, just a woodland creature. Which one? Don't know. But just something, a, a creature whose ears go, whoosh, what's that? You know what I mean? Like someone who's going to be hunted. Because obviously hobbits are not carnivores. They're not like the top of the food chain. They're just peaceful, getting on with it. Farmers, you know, live on the land. Rural people who just like ale and food, you know, and living a quiet life. So I thought, well, okay, he's, he's not an alligator. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's just someone who just wants to gather berries. And obviously creatures who gather berries have got things hunting them. And so I think he was, his, just, his radar was always up. Also, the feet, you know, if you've got feet this big, it makes you walk in a different way because you're picking up your legs more than you would normally have to do to get clearance from the ground for the toes, you know. So that gives you a different gait. Yeah, I just had to sort of, again, walk that line of giving him all the humanity you can because he's basically carrying you through three films, but also remembering that he's not, just, he's not actually just a dude. He's, he's not. He's a... It, they're not human. <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're, they're human-ish, but they're not exactly the same as us. Sherlock. My only preconception was potentially negative and turned out to be wrong, thankfully, you know. But my, my feeling was, do we, do we need an updated Sherlock? You know, I, I kind of felt, at its worst, it would be willfully sort of anachronistic and cool and, hey, we're making him drive, you know, like a sports car, you know, just stuff that was, that I would find annoying, actually, you know. But I wasn't reckoning, on, of course, on how good Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss were. And I should have done, because I know they're very good. But um, I only thought that for five minutes. And then I thought, and then I saw the script and thought, no, it's within page three, you think, yes, yeah, is really, really smart. It's exciting, it's funny, it's visceral. And you knew that if it was going to be shot and directed well, it, this was going to be a great show. That was ridiculous. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever done. And you invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> Benedict, I think, was already on board, and I came back for my callback um, and read with him, and it became clear immediately that we had a rhythm together that was unusual, as in unusually easy, and we complemented each other very, very well. I had no interest in being, and nor was it written like that, a bumbling, kind of slightly foolish... Fall guy, do you know what I mean? I thought, well, the world doesn't need to see that. I don't want to f***ing play that. And it wasn't that anyway. So it, it allowed me to sort of be, to be a strong character as well, you know, and to cut him down a bit and to take the piss out of him. So it was a bit more equal than, oh, there's Sherlock and, oh, and there's John Watson over there somewhere, you know. I mean, clearly it's still Sherlock. It's still a more Sherlock show than John's, obviously. But still it was much more even-handed than I think a lot of the versions of that, of that, friendship that we've ever seen, you know. Alex Woodbridge didn't know anything special about art. And? And... Well, is that it? No habits, hobbies, no, personality? No, give us a chance, he was an amateur astronomer. Hold that cab. It was a sort of barbed friendship and a sort of angular friendship. It wasn't kind of just easy, hey, it was, you know, we kind of 
took lumps out of each other sometimes, and I and I loved that. But yeah, it was it was one of those things. Chemistry you can't manufacture, and you can't fake. It was it was very fortunate because as soon as we started reading together, I thought, oh, this would really really work. And I already knew him a little bit, his work. I thought he was really really good, and I thought, yeah, he's going to be great. I would love to do this because I think this could be a very good show. Love actually. It's only vaguely a bugbear when people go, oh, you played that porn star in Love Actually. It's like, no, well, okay. I, it wasn't actually meant to be a porn star. It was meant to be two people who were stand-ins on a film set, but fine, you know, that, that's the sort of most often misunderstood one of my roles, I think. I was working with Joanna Page um, in our scenes, and, she, you know, she had to have her top off fairly quickly. And um, by the way, he introduced me as John, but actually everyone calls me Jack. Oh, oh fine. Nice to meet you, Jack. Richard Curtis makes a very good set. You know, he, he sets the tone. He tries to put everyone at ease as humanly possible, whatever they're doing. I was fully dressed, she was half dressed. I had to be behind her, gently sort of cupping her breasts, right? You know, about a minute after we've met, sort of, you know. Right. Uh, massage them, please. But the comedy being that we're having mundane, everyday conversations while we're in this ridiculous position or while I'm in the you know position of pretend to be hip thrusting her while we're talking about how bad the traffic was getting here kind of thing. Again, two sweet people having a sweet conversation but as stand-ins on a movie set sort of acting out very sexual stuff, you know. Being naked or nearly naked is always kind of it's a tough one, man. It's you know, it's not because that in front of however many people, it's not the first thing you would volunteer for, I don't think, man or woman, it's not the first thing you'd think, I know, I've got an idea. <laughs> And so in that sense, you need to well, hopefully be enjoying it and you need to really focus on a, on a well-written scene. And it's very different if you're doing a love scene or a sex scene, which these were not, because that, that, that is about, you know, love and sex and, oh, baby. This was about something totally, to, you know, the dialogue could have been, should have been happening in a cafe with two people just having a chat over a cup of coffee, you know. But it was happening when we were both naked and I was pretending to, you know, you. This is a real pleasure. It's lovely to find someone I can actually chat to. Like, it's very incongruous. Hence the comedy, I hope. Black Panther. Well, yeah, the, what's nice about playing Everett Ross in Black Panther is, and before that in Civil War, once he gets to Wakanda, he's absolutely a fish out of water. So I suppose in some way, the way that he was viewing this technology and like this futuristic place is a sort of audience conduit as well because we don't live in Wakanda and we don't live in that sort of futuristic world. He is a very, very high status in his world, in his job, very high status person. And then to have that all taken away and he sort of has no status, that was interesting. I guess I've often played people who find themselves in extraordinary circumstances. What? You were a great pilot. Don't worry, I'll guide you through it. It's just like riding a hoverbike. Black Panther was one of those that, obviously you get on the Marvel train and the train is operating just fine without you. It's gonna carry on with or without you just fine. And it's one of the few things that you will ever do in your life where you know there is a huge audience for it. Most other things you do in your life, you hope there's gonna be an audience for it, but this is a big old train. As I say, it's been rolling just fine. So that well, people will see it, people definitely watch this but the extent of which w was, again, very overwhelming and very gratifying. You know, people loved it. Shuri, the last cargo ship is almost at the border, but they got me trapped with some kind of cable. My sort of joke impression of Ryan was that he would walk away and come back four times. <laughs> so he'd say, the, 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 the. A lot of stroking of his beard. It was a mighty beard as well. The, the more it went on, he got, like, it was a good old beard. And there's a lot of stroking of that, lots of pauses, yeah, and then go away. So you go, okay, right. And then he comes back, and, well, uh, it's like Columbo. One more thing. I mean, that is not, not to give the impression he was in any way uber controlling or it. I mean, he's totally trusting. I felt I had a lot of freedom on that set. You know, like I felt like people were playing. If they wanted to play, you could definitely play. It wasn't keeping you in a box, because he trusted his actors, but he just, if he had a detailed, thing that he wanted you to think about. He really wanted you to get every syllable of what he meant. I think he hates the idea of being misunderstood. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think one of my skills in life, I think, is being quite good at not feeling amazing pressure. I, I genuinely don't, I don't really feel 
pressure that much at work. I feel pressure in other ways, in family life and like real life, I can feel pressure at the drop of a hat. But in work, it takes a lot for me to really feel intimidated. You know what I mean? Like I didn't feel that playing Bilbo, didn't feel that playing John Watts. I didn't, because I think, well, I've got every right to have a go at this. You know, someone else will have a go in 20 years and someone else had a go before and they're perfectly entitled to it. This is my go, you know. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy had been a, a radio show, it had been albums, there'd been a TV show in the, in the UK in the early 80s that I remember as a young kid. And the portrayal of Arthur, and, I, and, it's, a, and it was, it's a good portrayal of Arthur. It's kind of how it's written as a sort of archetypal middle-class, slightly posh man who was bamboozled by everything. I thought, there's something in me, obviously, that they've seen they want me to do it. And this is a long time ago, you know, it's all they would have seen really was The Office, do you know what I mean? I thought, well, I've just got to be the truth that I can bring to it as opposed to somebody else. His name is Arthur Dent. He is a five foot eight inch tall ape descendant and someone is trying to drive a bypass through his house. When you're playing a completely different version, like a cover version of the same song, you've got to just do your own version, I think. I was very aware that a lot of people I loved and people in my family were dying. I was so pleased that I was doing it. And so I wanted to honour that and I was really pleased for them and I was pleased for the people who I loved, who loved the books. But yes, I think I'm quite good at not feeling overawed by things, to be honest. I try and treat things quite soberly, and even though of course I get excited about it, of course I do. Um, and I am on my knees metaphorically every day thanking God that I'm an actor. Before you start having your own party about how excited you are, you've got to do the work, and the work's hard. It's hard to be good. You know, so I really, really want to be good in this job, so I want to sort of concentrate on it. So I, and you just know that pr feeling that pressure is not going to help. It's not going to help at all. I think I'm a big believer in everyone does their best work when they're a little bit relaxed or when they feel free, you know. If you contain someone and sort of try and control what they're doing and scare them, people, I just don't think people work well out of fear. But I think acting's really fun. It's really fun, and, uh, and, it should, and it should be. And I'm only ever gonna be half decent at it if I'm enjoying it. So, no, I didn't feel pressure. Fargo. I, along with the rest of the world, when, when we started doing Fargo, had just watched Breaking Bad, right? And so that there, was a, there was a hint of that. There was a hint of that in it. Straight person, trying to do his best. I mean, Lester was far more beta. He's described in the script as a sort of person who, if you knocked into him, he would apologise to you. But he has his own little journey of a turn. Something happens in his life and it's not the same again. It was the, the tide. You know, I, I, I was um, standing up to the... I was... Uh, I was being a man. <sighs> but you're not a man, Lester. And then, of course, much later on, we join him and he's... As you say, he's, he's become a kind of alpha. And just when he thinks his life is going to be alpha, then, then something happens again and it's all gone to <laughs> Because I suppose in real life I believe in um, chaos and I believe, in, I believe that a lot of things are chaos and it's... I suppose I believe in that more than I believe in conspiracy, generally. I believe in the cock-up, you know? And one second, split-second decision changes his life completely. Obviously, you know, he didn't plan it, he didn't want it to happen necessarily. He wasn't thinking, how can I kill my... One... So I, I, as an actor, I like dealing with the un... I like, I like a character dealing with the unknown, and I like a character... It's more interesting, I guess. I mean, even though I, I'd love to play the guy who comes off a yacht with a margarita, I'd love, I'd love to fucking do that. But, uh, but I suppose, really, what I find interesting is the stuff that I find interesting in real life, which is how, do we, how are we all coping? <laughs> do you know what I mean? How are we all working this out? Lester had that in spades. I mean, he was just constantly... Like a very, very reactive character, reacting to bigger and more cynical people than himself. Oh, oh yeah, I, I'm gonna pick her up probably Friday. Uh, no, sir, I'm supposed to tell you your car's not ready yet. What do you mean? It's, uh, well, forensic team is looking at it. Forensic? Yes, sir. I stay in the accent all, all day, from the time I'm picked up in the morning to rap. I have a pretty good ear, right? So I'd be able to do a, a fairly good stab at an accent, like, quite quickly. But I think after a while, you would start to hear inconsistencies if you treat it like a sketch or a skit, you know? You're not in SNL. You're not just doing a gag. You've got to go over 10 hours of, of believing these people. So you can't uh, mock 
You can't take a shortcut and go, oh, they probably sound something like this, you know. So I wanted to really do it properly. I obviously had help. A couple of sessions before we started shooting, there was a guy on set all the time while we were shooting. If I would ever have like a week away from work, well, I mean, I would use YouTube. There were a couple of videos that I used of young guys from Minnesota uh, just, to just talking. Once you've got that keyed into your DNA for the time being, you just need to quickly refresh it if, you haven't, if you've not been talking like that for a while. I would just like to say how sorry I am mm. about your husband. Uh, he, we, we went to high school together. So some people, of course, say, we don't sound like that. And other people from Minnesota say, no, we, we do. Yeah, you, you got it. And I think I, I was very happy in that a lot of people from Minnesota said to me, no, that was, that was pretty good. So I'll, I'll take that all day long. Yeah. The world's end. I've known Edgar and Simon for a long time. It felt a little bit like um, like a gang of mates getting together and uh, sort of having fun. Because I know them, it was as I hoped and expected it would be, really. You know, it was just uh, fun, but, but work. Because at the, at the, it's still obviously, a, it's graft, you know, because you are still coming in very early, going home late, and the cliche is, especially in comedy, you've got to work hard. Like, yeah, I think you've got to work hard all the fucking time, you know, but... But especially if you're trying to make things funny, um, it's, not, it's not always massively easy. It is sometimes, sometimes, it is, but not always. You have my card. Gary. WTF? It's good to see you too, oh man. Please don't call me oh man. Sure. Hey, Oliver Chamberlain was written as everyone's annoying, yuppie idiot, you know, like, the way the characters are introduced, you have to get a pretty easy read on all of them, I guess. Um, and his is a sort of work-obsessed, career-obsessed um, yuppie who was, had been a yuppie from the age of, like, 16. I think that's where he saw himself, you know. He makes, yeah, he makes bold films, Edgar, because when you think it's, oh, it's, it's this sort of film, and then it's, actually, it's also a sort of, there's martial arts bits, there's great, great fights in it, fantastic fight sequences in it. And then, of course, the whole sci-fi dystopian bit, but he's got a, he's got a real ambition an energy to his work, I think. And sometimes you see him over at the monitor acting out with his every sinew of his body, everything we're doing. And very occasionally with a director, and I've had it before, I've had it many times before, where you do something and you catch the director kind of going, oh, like that. You think, oh, I guess they didn't like that. <laughs> when you see the disappointment on a director's face at something you've just done, you go, know, fuck, you know. Um, but no, he's a, he's a real dynamo. Breeders. Breeders started with me, it started as my idea, and I uh, sort of then brought it to my uh, clever confreres, Chris Addison and Simon Blackwell, and we developed the show together. And it came out of, for me, and I think similarly for Simon and Chris, um, as, as we found out in our various father's meetings <laughs> after that, which we pretended were development meetings, but actually it was like father's therapy sort of thing. Yeah, it's the discovery that at the centre of it, Paul, who I play, is a person who has thought all his life he's a nice guy. He's been told he's a nice person. I'm, I'm a nice guy. I'm a decent guy. And then you become a father, and then you realise there is a side to you that is not nice, like impatient, spoiled, entitled. And having someone read your fortune like that, and they're a baby, is like, that's quite alarming, you know. In my own experience, lots of things came out about my personality of like, I, I don't, why, why am I this angry? It's, it was, it's kind of amazing, it's amazing, because at the same time as you're feeling more love for a person than you felt possible to feel, and I still feel, obviously, about my two kids, um, it's possible to turn on a dime and want to throw yourself out of a window, <laughs> you know? There we go. Oh, mother! Dad! 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 Wake up! <laughs> sorry, sorry. And what's this? You decimated Breeders, we've... Hopefully, manage to get a world where it's as many things in the programme as it is in real life. It's, you know, in the course of an hour, I will be kissing them, laughing with them, hugging them, shouting at them, uh, trying to feed them, trying, you know, like, uh, it's all of it, and it's all-encompassing. One of the things that made me want to do it was I couldn't go to any more nice London dinner parties where people were just going, isn't it amazing being a parent? Isn't it... Oh. Isn't it just incredible? Like, yeah, of, of course it is. Like, of, like, for me, the love thing takes care of itself. There's no question you are going to adore this child. Ava, this isn't helping. Ava, I can't get my keys out. Ava. <laughs> no, no, no. I love you.
Doggy Daddy. My job is the same everywhere. If I make a student film next week, then my job is the same as it is on Black Panther. It's to convince in in that scene. You know, it's to be truthful to that scene. And you know, I glibly say this, but I think it's true. The difference is catering. You know, that's, craft service is the biggest difference. It's all the same, really, apart from, apart from all the whistles and bells. Your job is exactly the same. Everything in life, everything in life is easy. Everything, unless you want to be good at it. If you want to do something well, it's really fucking hard. Football, piece of cake. Be good at it is a bit harder. You know what I mean? Acting, I th I'm always thinking, oh yeah, I'm trying to always play it off. Eh, it's, it's not down to mine, is it? No, it's pretty good. It's, uh, to be good at it, it's not that easy, actually, you know. It's a w lifetime struggle <laughs> to try and be a good actor, and it's, it, that, that work never stops. I've done so many iconic roles. God, I'm, I'm such an amazing icon. It's almost like we should do a video about you. Yeah, why is no one doing that? <laughs>